Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books and Political Science, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Susan Lee Bell at St. Joseph's University, and today I'm joined by Dr. Christopher Chavez to discuss his book, The Sound of Exclusion, NPR and the Latinx Public, published by the University of Arizona Press in 2021. How is power enacted in everyday broadcast practices? National Public Radio has a rhetoric of impartiality, but this obscures the ideological work done by the network. Sound of Exclusion interrogates how NPR determines what it means to be American and what is deemed American news. NPR's original mandate included engaging listeners in civic discourses and representing the diversity of the nation. Yet Christopher Chavez argues that NPR has created a white public space that pushes Latinx listeners to the periphery. As a result, NPR promotes the cultural logic that Latinx identity is separate from national identity, hindering Latinx participation in civic discourses. But Chavez maintains that the shared act of listening might facilitate ways in which Latinx listeners negotiate and resist norms of what it means to belong, also known as sonic citizenship. He writes that through the act of listening, those without sustained access to political power might imagine alternative political possibilities in which they are included. Dr. Christopher Chavez is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon, where he also directs the Center for Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies. His publications include a previous book, Reinventing the Latino Television Viewer, Language, Ideology, and Practice from Lexington Books in 2015. I I rarely read a book that intersected with so much of my personal and professional life, one that really changed how I listened to the world, and I'm delighted to welcome Chris Chavez to the New Books Network. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me. So a lot of uh, New Books Network listeners may also be devoted NPR listeners. So let's start with an example of the type of reporting that you're interrogating in the book. You open with half a million people gathered in downtown Los Angeles to protest the passage of the Border Protection, Anti-Terrorism, and Illegal Immigration Control Act of 2006. So tell us a little bit about how this protest was covered by news organizations, and and how you characterize the reporting by NPR. So this was a moment that happened around 2005, 2006. And um, I chose this moment because it was a pivot moment. At the time, there was an expectation that this was the point where Latinos were really going to come out politically. They were going to start to mobilize and suddenly lay claim to political power. And that obviously never happened. And in fact, in recent years, there's been some stunning reversals uh, since that time. But I was really interested in the journalistic coverage of that particular event, um, specifically how different news organizations, um, especially particularly English language commercial news organizations, really just sort of treated as a form of foreign correspondence. It's like they were not really comfortable, uh, one, speaking to Latinos in Spanish, um, but it was really sort of a removed, dispassionate point of view especially when compared to what was going on on commercial Spanish language radio at the time. And it was that sort of disparity that really intrigued me uh, because um, in in sort of popular discourses, public is seen as serving the public interest. Commercial media is not being antithetical of this, but here was a case in which Spanish language commercial media really took the reins and really took an active role in engaging Latinos politically um, to the point of mobilization, turning that mobilization into um, acts of, like really real acts of citizenship, including voting drives, uh, getting more information about policy. Uh, and so you sort of had a, a reverse logic for that moment in time. Um, but I was really interested in, again, using this moment to understand how NPR specifically covered it uh, and in doing so perpetuating dual frames of criminality, uh, of economic resources. And so it really wasn't adding anything new to the conversation. In some cases, it was perpetuating racial hierarchies. So had you been thinking about this for some time? Like, what, what's the origin, project, uh, origin story of the project it, itself that you kind of got to this moment of understanding that there was this exclusion taking place? I think a couple of moments. So I've, I've long been an NPR listener, probably like many of the listeners of this podcast. 
and really feeling ambivalent about that. And so knowing that I enjoy the content, but also knowing that I'm probably the ideal Latinx listener for NPR. I'm highly educated. Uh, I'm politically aware. I have uh, significant amounts of, of social, cultural, political capital compared to many people for whom NPR was designed. Uh, so I'm very aware that I fit their model quite nicely. Um, but I think the real impetus for this was around the time that Trump was um, campaigning for office. Uh, and I tell a story in the book where I was at a meeting at our NPR member station here locally, and um, you know, then candidate Trump was in town giving a, a talk, and, and there was some debate about well, why would he come to Oregon, the dependably blue state. Um, but I was really interested in our news director's response, which was, well, we're just going to cover him like we would every other candidate. Um, and the story that came out of it was very dispassionate. Um, you know, I think according to journalistic standards, they would say objective. Um, but it really spoke to this larger moment where commercial news media, national news media, failed to raise any sort of alarms. I mean, there were a lot of, of racialized re rhetoric, uh, very heated rhetoric, and sort of the dispassion in which news organizations approach the topic was surprising to me. Um, and so that started uh, an ongoing investigation into, well, how do news organizations approach this? And specifically NPR, which claims to represent the public, um, I began to sort of question, well, has it always been this way? What was it originally meant to be? What has it become? Um, and then how is it adapting at this really important moment in time of demographic, cultural, and political change? And I love in that story that you also add that nobody in the room seemed to recognize the potential for manipulation by the Trump team itself in appearing in Oregon. In other words, it would get reported in a sense because they had come, not because it was necessarily a story. And I, 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 I really... I really appreciated how, well, throughout the book, really, you're always dealing with these multiple ways to to think about NPR and what it is they're doing. You you mentioned the the origins of NPR, so let's talk a little bit about what kind of news organization NPR was supposed to be. A lot of people don't remember a world before NPR, um, but we know what. Did the night original, I think it's 1970 mission statement, what did it what did it look like? What was it supposed to to do? Um, you write in the book that there was the hope that that NPR and the public broadcasting system, PBS, would be, you know, would be like a la Shirley Chisholm, you know, unbought and un unbossed. So so what were they hoping for? I think originally it was meant to be an alternative to commercial news media. Um, and like you said, today, it, it's something completely different. It is commercial news media. So I say if you were to open up the websites of NPR, the New York Times, the Washington Post, their stories would look remarkably similar and they would share a very similar taste sensibility. They'd be written in very similar kinds of ways. Um, but it wasn't meant to be that way. So it was really meant to be an alternative to commercial news organizations, largely because there was some suspicion around the commercial nature of media. Um, that once you add sort of the economic incentive into it, that's going to drive the kind of listener you're going to pursue. You're going to, you know, necessarily pursue an audience that has economic resources to pay for what you're offering or to subsidize it. Uh, NPR had was established in the longstanding tradition of educational radio, which goes back to the very early on, you know, days of, of uh, media. Um, and so these conversations have been happening. And then the idea was that you would build some sort of sustainable framework in which you can create an alternative news source that would serve the nation's most disenfranchised uh, people that had been left out of commercial media because of the economic structures of it. So I think the hope was that NPR would really be for the most disenfranchised alternative media um, and that it would, again, serve those kinds of audiences in new kinds of ways. And so when you do read that original mission statement rich, written by Bill Seamering, it's beautifully inclusive. I mean, it, it's, it's lofty in its ambitions. Uh, but beautifully diverse and inclusive. And there's language in there like it will speak in many voices. It will not, you know, uh, it'll account for the genuine diversity of human nature. But there's such an openness to the human, you know, the, the nature of diversity uh, across the human spectrum. It would tell different kinds of stories and different kinds of voices. Um, and so, it, you know, in some ways, again, it was it was a very lofty vision. Uh, and so I, I was lucky enough to interview Bill Seamering for this book because I was very, very curious to understand, okay, Bill, this is what you had imagined NPR would be in 1970. This is what it's become. Is it what you thought it had become? 
And in some ways, you know, Bill is not inclined to be critical of NPR. It's, it's something that he's built and it's substantive and it plays, you know, it is an important social actor and political actor right now. Uh, so he's not inclined to be critical of it. Uh, but it was very revealing some of the conversations that we were able to have about, again, that original vision and then how it's been enacted later on. Uh, I think he would even agree at this point. There's probably some um, things he did not account for uh, that has changed sort of the pathway that NPR has gone through. So uh, you write in the book that Habermas was sort of skeptical that radio could, you know, promote this kind of rich version of the public spirit because it would be driven by economic interests. And and part of the idea of NPR would be that, well, it wouldn't be, that the, that there, the money wouldn't uh, uh, drive the uh, over overcome the mission. Now you said that um, Bill Simmering wasn't wasn't ready to criticize it, but you are. So mm-hmm. how has this evolved over time, and and how has appealing to audiences, as as most you know commercial broadcasters have to do, how has that affected um, NPR or or just in general? How is it that this has been different than the mission? So the funding model never really made it sustainable, uh, and so I'd say within the first thing you know, two or three years, NPR executives and, and executives at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, sort of the governing arm of it, um, really came to terms with the fact that they needed long-term sustainable funding for this. And so I'd say, you know, within about 10 or 12 years, they really made the pivot towards a market orientation. Um, when I spoke with Bill, you know, it was interesting because one of the things he read out of this mission statement was that NPR would not treat its audience like a market. But there's evidence that they did, you know, beginning in the 1980s, that they really made a pivot to thinking about the listener from being a member of the public, the listening public, uh, citizens in this democracy, to being members of um, a market or an audience that could be measured. And that measurement became really important to how they drove their mission. Um, and so it was in the you know 1980s where they started to adapt the um, marketing practice of market segmentation. Uh, and in very clear terms, they made the choice to to target the most affluent, the highly educated listener that had the economic resources that could support NPR and to make it sustainable. Um, so it wasn't that it necessarily ignored its diversity mandate, but it did rearticulate its diversity mandate in terms of this economically, politically active listener. So whatever um, you know, Black, Latinx listeners they were going to pursue had to fit this model and they had to be highly educated. Um, with significant amounts of economic, social, and cultural capital. Right. And the inclination to to make those donations and consider right. them as part of this, as an audience, and in a sense, establish itself by its willingness to send some sort of a donation to keep NPR going because it doesn't have this independent uh, funding. And you do lots of interesting work in the book to explain the extent to which not funding NPR had some of these implications. Um, you. There's a lot of literature on NPR, and some of it is self-promoting, you know, produced by the network itself, celebrating itself. And, uh, you know, and as you say, people like Bill Simmering, they're journalists who made their careers there, and it's very hard for them to potentially be critical. However, there's a lot of scholarship that is critical of NPR and how it developed. And, and I'm going to talk about methods in a minute, because you are a <laughs> remarkably uh, diverse in the methods that you bring to this book. And it's actually one of the wonderful surprises and the reason so many people should read the book. Because, uh, but, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But for the moment, just tell us a little bit about what the literature on Latinx media studies looks like, especially you know the scholarship focused on radio, so we can understand a little bit more about the field and also how your work is making a unique contribution. For example, your focus on NPR's diversity mandate. Thank you. Yes. Um, so there are almost two piles of literature that I was hoping to draw on, and, and one was on public radio. Uh, as you'd mentioned, NPR itself has become a generator and curator of its own history. And so there's a ton of insight there, but there's also been some very critical work. Engelman, Macaulay, uh, Jason Laviglio, Al Stavitsky, who have all done work on NPR um, and have long made the argument, you know, the economic argument that I, I tap into here, uh, which is that what started off as a quasi amateurish uh, alternative form of media has become highly professionalized, a significant political player, uh, one that in some ways relies heavily on, on an ongoing crisis of funding. 
right? And so in some ways they capitalize off of it because they're always under threat. Um, you know, even during the, the course of writing this book, um, President Trump had threatened, you know, to defund NPR, which is a common refrain. And this in turn generates new interest and new support for the network. And so in some ways it, it relies on a, a continued sustenance of, of crises. Um, so that that model, I think, was pretty, I, I think, well-formed long before I tapped into it. I think what was missing in that literature was the, the racial ideologies that also intersect with capitalist ideologies. Um, and so here I turned in the literature on uh, Latinx media, in particular Latinx radio. So Dolores Inés Casillas' work on sound of belonging, her focus on Spanish language radio, uh, specifically serving as, as an important space to engage listeners civically, again, focusing on commercial Spanish language radio. Um, Mari Castaneda's work on um, public radio, uh, particularly at the community level uh, and with networks like Radio Bilingue, who again have a really different kind of um, journalistic ethos and a sense of mission on how they're serving their listeners in very, very direct ways. And so uh, their listener is the disenfranchised Latino who um, is often vulnerable to state forces, uh, again, to economic forces. They are not always, you know, in the linguistic majority, not only English speaking, but in some cases, speakers of indigenous languages, uh, but how under certain kinds of conditions, public radio stations can serve in a really important civic role uh, in a way that looks very different than uh, what NPR is doing. So um, I don't know how to quite say this, but I felt reading the book, every page had somebody I knew on it. And I, and, and I thought, wait, what? Wait, he, he's pulling from sociology. He's pulling like, wait, Christina Beltran, that's political theory. Um, you know, in one one sentence, you'll mention, you know, Nancy Frazier's, you know, subaltern counterpublic. And then the next minute, uh, something that I don't know because it comes from a literature that isn't in political science or something adjacent to it. So I, I don't want to interrupt the flow of discussing the book, but I do want to ask you a little bit about your training in terms of um, content and and methods and how it is that you bring together all of this. Um, I mean, this is an amazing bibliography. People could just buy the book for the bibliography and not read the book and they would still have spent their money well. So can you just say a little bit about um, how you bring all of this together in the writing and um, uh yeah, I'll just leave Thank it you. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think part of it is is working in media studies and the tradition of media studies, which is very interdisciplinary in nature. Uh, and so we are drawing from sociology and anthropology, critical cultural studies, uh, critical race theory. Um, you know, most of my work is not necessarily social psychological, so that's probably not a literature that I, I typically would go into. Um, but from this topic, just and, and this is the beautiful thing about being able to write a book is that you sort of go down the rabbit hole and you're just able to kind of read everything and your appetite for reading all of the literatures around this becomes so um, um, so interesting and compelling and people are making very fascinating arguments. And so just seeing the connections, I hope, um, between these various literatures um, and then that can inform the methods. I think the primary method um, was um, documents. So I think originally had been really been in, in looking at kind of historical documents uh, congressional records, uh, documents that were generated by NPR, reports from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so all that stuff is publicly available. Um, but I did find myself just wanting to know more about context. Um, and when cases where uh, a particular author, you know, had authored a report um, or there was a specific person that, you know, founded or produced a podcast, I reached out to them. And for the most part, people were pretty generous with their time. Um, and actually, knock on wood, I was I was pretty surprised at how responsive people were and, and open and candid in their conversations um, about NPR practices. Um, and so I thought that was pretty, uh, again, I'm very grateful to that. I, I think in some ways, the work, for me, at least the, the book acts on a couple of levels. You know, it, it tells the story of NPR over the course of its 50-year history. But hopefully, it's also a glimpse of this particular moment in time, because it was written during the four years of the Trump presidency of how journalists, producers, particularly Latinx journalists and producers, were dealing with what it was like to be a journalist during this moment in which, you know, you were, felt like you were being attacked. It was very personal in nature, uh, the kind of work that was being done and, and kind of negotiating that, that moment in time. 
Um, how did you determine who to reach out to? I mean, you had something like 50 in-depth qualitative interviews with all sorts of public radio practitioners, and, and some of them you name, and, and everybody knows them, and some yeah. of them you don't name. Uh, how did you decide who to interview? Had you done qualitative interviews previously in your work? You have that lovely section in which you self-interrogate what it is that might have uh, uh, um, been able to be reached because of your status as not a journalist, as a, as a scholar. Um, can you say just a little bit about how you picked the people? So in some ways, it came from a phenomenon itself. So if I was studying, for example, or, or writing about Latino USA, um, I thought, well, it'd probably be important to talk to um, Maria Hinojosa or her team. And so I reached out to her. This was, you know, I've done qualitative interviews in the past. Uh, I like doing that form of, of um, method. But at the same time, I've never had to identify anybody. So it's always been sort of uh, a general sort of uh, assumptions based on testimonies and then the insights come from the aggregate of that testimony. In this case, it was really hard to do that. And I struggled with it because these were high profile figures. Um, and so if you, you know, I, I couldn't say, well, uh, an anonymous producer of um, Latino USA was X. Um, in this case, it became very clear of who I was talking to. Uh, and so that did, that was very uncomfortable for me as a scholar to start to name places. Um, and then also on the back end, knowing that these people have a much bigger platform than I do, and so if they disagreed with something upon the book's publication, or if they, um, it just, it, it, would, it made me worried for a whole other range of reasons. But for the most part, people were, were very generous um, and kind in, in what they were doing in their interviewing. And what kind of feedback have you gotten from the people who, you know, love NPR or feel attached to the work that they've done with NPR? So I know before the book was published, a lot of folks at NPR asked for, for um, pre-published copies. Um, and so that came up. So I know they've read them. But since then, it's sort of been radio silence. I'm not sure if they like it or if they dislike it, if they you know don't see it as a thread or if they don't find the, the message compelling. Um, but I haven't heard much from the folks that were interviewed. But I know they were very interested going into it. Um, those folks that have reached out to me, um, again, have been somewhat complimentary. You know, they, they like the argument. Um, I've heard from folks that said, thank you. Nobody's really written in this depth on the Latinx listener specifically. Um, in some cases, I've been approached by NPR and some member stations about quick fixes, which is always a difficult conversation because uh, the network knows that they have to change. So it's not like they're, any of this is malicious. Uh, I think they know they have to change. But the, I think what's been surprising to me is they want to change without wanting to change. Uh, and so everybody's looking for that fix of, okay, I'm going to hire a, um, a, a diverse host, uh, or I'm going to invest in a specific program thinking that that's going to change it. So I've really been surprised at just the unwillingness to, to really rethink the whole enterprise altogether, or at least how you conceptualize the audience. Um, I, I think there's sort of this assumption that if I just make a few adjustments, I'll get there and I will achieve greater diversity and inclusion well, in some ways, isn't that just a reflection of the bigger question that we're in at this moment in time? You know, you mentioned the years that you're writing the book. Is it that American democracy is fundamentally flawed at its roots, or has it simply failed to be inclusive and we just need to add a few more branches to the tree and everything will be okay? And so in a lot of ways, it it's not unsurprising to me that that NPR would react in that way. I think that that is very hard to look and to say that at the root there's a problem that needs to be to be addressed. Um, well, that's fascinating. I guess I would have expected you to have been on NPR more, um, but I couldn't find it when I was doing a little background research for this. So I guess that confirms why. Yeah. As a um, side note, I I don't know if it's on the, or off the record, but I was interviewed by NPR's Code Switch. And after the interview, I thought, I don't think they're going to um, they're going to air it just because it was critical of NPR. Um, and the host was a little defensive about it. And so um, so I, it, and it, it never did. It never did make it. Um, so I think they're curious. I think they're interested. But um, I don't know if they're willing to, to really critique themselves, at least publicly. No, I, I, I think the. I can't recommend this book enough. It's it's written very well, so it's an easy read, even though 
And when I see the word Habermas, I usually have to take a deep breath that, that, okay, what's coming? But in fact, you make everything accessible. You explain all of, you know, from sociolinguistics to Habermas, you're, you're, you make it all very, very clear. I think this is an easy book for anyone to read. But it is a book that, f- for somebody like me that listens to a lot of NPR, that thinks that I listen critically, that thinks that I do hear some of the things that you're pointing out, I nevertheless have missed a lot. And I would imagine that being in that enterprise, it would be very, very hard to 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 to, to see something beyond the quick fix. Um, I, I want to say one sort of sort of nonlinear thing, which is that since this is new books in political science, I, you know, ideology plays a huge role in this book for for listeners who are interested. So, so there is this sort of constant emphasis on the fact that that there is a system of thought that's maintaining these power relations that are invisible to NPR. So in a lot of ways, I, 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 I think it's not a surprise that you could do these interviews and that, in fact, people are not thinking of themselves as ideological. They are understanding themselves to be neutral um, in a way that they, that's how they distinguish themselves from commercial media as, as being slanted in some way, but they're not seeing that there's something much, much bigger and deeper. Um, okay, the book is divided into two different sections. And the first is this kind of looking uh, at it from the outside macro. Um, and you think in terms of, of logics, you know, you think about the way in which very specific logics undermine NPR's capacity to serve the Latinx community, which you're, you're, you know, you remind us was one of its original uh, missions. So in the first chapter, you're looking at how NPR imagines the ideal Latinx listener. Um, and you've already said a little bit about, about yourself as, as, as one of them, and also a little bit about this move from the public to an audience. Uh, but um Say a little bit more about how NPR does imagine this ideal Latinx listener. So I think overall they, they imagine they're just their, their listener in general as somebody with significant amounts of cultural capital. And so when you look at sort of the, the arm that kind of sells uh, NPR listeners to corporate sponsors, the way they talk about the NPR listener is somebody that is, is highly connected, that loves to go to museums, that drinks wine, uh, that's more likely to be a C-level employee. And so this is somebody, again, that is really well connected. Uh, and so their conceptualization of the Black and Latinx audience is somebody that has to fit or at least be congruent with that audience. Um, and that's something that they've been you know, nodding to at least since 1998 uh, with Audience 98 report um, and some of the discourses afterwards. But really thinking about uh, Latinos that have, again, significant amounts of cultural capital that are English-speaking, uh, and that's pretty important given sort of the the language um, and linguistic practices that they've employed. This is a English dominant um, Latinx listener, uh, somebody that is intellectually curious, uh, somebody that's more likely to listen to uh, global music from across the world, um, but somebody that fits really nicely with who they're already speaking to. Uh, I think the way that this is, um, that's the way that it works for them. So somebody, I spoke with somebody from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and though he framed it as uh, it needs to be additive, right? So if you're going to you know, bring in new folks, uh, you have to add in new listeners. The idea is not to replace listeners, so to get rid of your legacy audience and then to replace that with a new uh, underserved, disenfranchised listener. That's not the goal is to just simply add on to what you currently have. Uh, that's the model that they're going for. And do you see the intersection with class? In a lot of ways, they're not addressing the working class um, listener. They they are looking for a sort of you know more than college educated or at least college educated. So so it's not simply about Latinx. It's also about class. Would you? Does that sound right? Right. It's a certain taste public that you're right is associated with class, social economic status, and so uh, many of these de- demographic cells are intersecting with one another. Um, and I think some of the practitioners that I spoke to were aware of this, uh, and they admitted as much during the interviews. Um, and but that's sort of the the kind of the mandate that they have to keep going. I think one of the interesting conversations that we got into is, okay, you have a, a, a Latinx program, but what is it really doing? Is it speaking to Latinx listeners, or are you really using Latinx listeners 
to speak to another audience that may or may not be Latinx, that is, uh, again, culturally affluent, uh, has significant amount of resources, red, white. Um, and so what are you doing with this content? Um, and even after doing some of the research, I'm not even sure how I, I land on that. You know, it feels like um, some of these programs really are packaging Latinos as, as a, a subject matter to white audiences. Um, and I was struck as I read the book, okay, so who does listen? Are we talking about the people who are already making policy and already have information getting more information? Or are we talking about creating a an educated voting public? And that has to include more than the elites who've already read the two newspapers before they even begin their listening of, 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 of NPR. You, you mentioned language, and the second chapter really focuses on a, a sort of a, a use of standard language that NPR, um, a, a decision that they've made, something that they maybe are not always aware of. Can you talk a little bit more about how that language piece also feeds into this um, uh, setting aside of Latinx and working class listeners? Yeah, I mean, that was a really fascinating part for me in covering in this book. But um, as a starting point, just imagining the diversity of language that we use in this nation. You know, we, we kind of have this ideological point of view that it is a English speaking country uh, and that everybody should speak in the same way, at least. Uh, but the reality is that, that we speak Arabic, we speak Spanish, we speak Mandarin, we speak so many different kinds of things. We speak in accents. And there's a beautiful, beautiful diversity to the human voice. Uh, that we hear. And if you live in a, a city like Los Angeles, for example, where I come from, it's very, very common to hear many different languages through the course of the day. Um, the world on NPR looks differently, even though it purports to, to represent the nation uh, or to speak in many dialects. It's a very, very standardized way of speaking, almost more so than some of you know other public media um, outlets, uh, which tend to experiment more with the range of voice. But NPR, almost to the point of satire, has become very, very neutral in its way of speaking. Um, and part of that is to, to not market ethnically, class-wise, regionally. Um, and the assumption there is that it's by speaking to, to nobody or marking nobody that you're speaking to everybody. Um, but it is a form of speaking that tends to privilege highly educated speakers, um, people that are not ethnic. Uh, and so it's almost acts in the same way that whiteness does. It's defined in terms of what it's not. And so to speak in terms of the standard is not to be speaking like, a Puerto Rican or somebody from Appalachia or a working class person from Brooklyn. Uh, and so it, it's it's defined in terms of what it's not. Um, but I found that within NPR, almost to the point where in some cases I'll listen to an NPR person and it sounds almost robotic, you know, just really divested of any kind of human emotion and again, any kind of markings um, that have, um, you know, can, can, can identify class, race, um, ethnic culture. And that has been sort of an ongoing process. And so the, I'd say the current iteration has been just a long practice that has been going on over the course of 50 years that has really kind of escalated, um, but something that they've committed to decades ago. Yeah. And you sometimes talk about the way language, especially Spanish, will be used as background noise, as if it's not translatable, as if it's as if it is noise, not discourse that would be part of the story. Um, and, and, that, and that's interesting because you start the book with this idea that in 2006, the, the rally in LA is being, is being reported as foreign correspondence because of, the, of that uncomfortableness. In fact, the, 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 the journalists are, are, it's so outside of their box that they are thinking about it as, as, as if they're listening to people from a different place. So I, I, I think the, the, it made me think a lot. It made me think a lot about what Melissa Harris Perry is doing. I don't know if you have ever listened to her show, but she she was first she was interim host and now she's the full time host and she has slowly changed some of how she is speaking a, a little bit more colloquial, just a little bit more of how she actually sounds if you see her at a conference or something. And so I think it's interesting how perhaps some individuals will make a little bit of this shift, even if there's this wider policy um, to, to stay within this quote unquote standard uh, Absolutely. And, and I'd say with, you know, many, um, cultural producers of color, you know, you work within the spaces that are allotted to and sort of find the margins on where you can operate. Um, 
I think it does raise kind of the question of what does diversity look like on on radio or even public radio? Is it a surname at this point? Uh, is it linguistic diversity? Is it a diversity of, of perspectives and stories? Uh, and so it looks differently on radio than it does on television or in film. Uh, and so that was one of the really interesting ideas to explore. Uh, the other kind of flip side of what Melissa uh, Harris Perry may be doing is is A. Martinez uh, and following the trajectory of his career. And so he started off in in sports radio, you know, commercial radio, and you're very vocal and very uh, emotive. And then by the time that I spoke to him when he was a, a host in L.A., you know, he was a little more neutral and he talks about the practices of producers and, and even modifying his own voice to sound more like the NPR standard. And, you know, now he's host of Morning Edition. And he has even moved further to the NPR norm. And so it suggests that there are some, you know, implicit coercive practices that discipline the voice to speak very, very much in line with the standard. Um, and one of the points that I make in the book is that there are, are differences on where you can do that. The spaces that NPR allows voices to be a little bit more uh, emotive, ethnic, uh, on NPR's flagship programs, they're, they're pretty protected. Uh, and so you're going to find a very, very disciplined way of speaking. On something like Code Mix, um, it might be a little bit different, or Alt Latino, which is one of the case studies that I focus on, uh, where you might have more code mixing, you might have a, a different range of, of voices, um, but certainly not every space within NPR is, is equal. No, and I think uh, uh, and I, you do such a good job describing all of all of these dynamics, and I and I also think there aren't as many examples out out there for people to understand. Well, how do you how do you how do you sound? You know how, how in a in a world in which there are um, very very few people who are the broadcasters, what are you supposed to do? And part of what you do is listen to the people who've come before you, which can narrow it even further. The the second part of your book is much more internal, much more micro, and you are looking at precisely Latinx cultural producers and how it is that they, uh, like Martinez, are finding ways to negotiate and, and, as you say, sometimes subvert the more general tendencies of NPR to silence Latinx voices. And uh, as you also refer to, you have these three case studies drawn from national Latinx-oriented NPR programs. Some of them are podcasts, some of them are radio. Uh, the first one is is Latino USA. And, um, and you already referred to um, having the opportunity to interview, I, I think, producer as well as Maria. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so, so talk to me a little bit about how it is uh, uh, she was able to negotiate with the power imbalances, what she was able to do, and also the kind of constraints that were there. Right. And so there are the three case studies, um, Latina USA and then uh, Radio Ambulante, which is a really different kind of, you know, it's more of a digital platform, and then Alt Latino, which is another podcast. Um, and each one kind of... Um, I think the one thing that they share is this you know, form of resistance. They've been able to work within the spaces that they have and, and again, um, you know, tell stories by Latinos for Latinos uh, in their own voices. So they've been able to do something like that. But they also, re, you know, were produced at very different points in time that in some ways draw on what was happening technologically, demographically, politically. Uh, and so Latino USA, it, you know, goes back 20 some years um, and it was founded by, um, you know, educators uh, through a grant program uh, and people working at the Corporation for Broadca- Public Broadcasting. So even though today it's been associated with Maria Hinojosa, it was really kind of a collective product of a, of a number of actors. Um, Maria was brought in uh, later on as host and then eventually became executive producer. But she's very, very savvy and business minded. And I think that's one thing that each of these cultural producers share is they're very fluent in marketplace logic, uh, which is great because if NPR is beholden to marketplace logic, then having those sort of business and entrepreneurial sensibilities is going to be a factor. It's going to help them um, sort of find their way into these spaces. Um, I focused on these three podcasts primarily because of the paucity of Latinx-oriented programming on NPR. So these were the ones. Uh, There weren't a, a ton to choose from. Um, but they did re- kind of represent different kinds of things, and they marked a particular moment in time. Um, so Maria just has come in with significant amounts of professional capital. She's a strong journalist. 
Um, she is highly engaging. She started off in the NPR system, so she has the professional habitus to sort of operate seamlessly within the public radio world. And so her story is is ongoing, right? She's been building to this moment for years. Um, and uh, every year that goes by, she comes better at it and more proficient and more business minded. And she's gotten to a point where she is treating her her podcast, and this is just one asset in this larger enterprise of Futuro Media, um, where she can have more control uh, and negotiate even handedly with NPR. And in this case, leave NPR uh, for more opportunities outside. Um, so that also speaks to the changing, you know, eco landscape, uh, media landscape that's happening here. Um, Radio Empolante was a different story because it's the opposite, right? It started off purely as a digital platform and with almost no public radio experience. Within a few years, you had a cultural producer be able to kind of create this podcast that has found success and then be carried on NPR within four or five years. Um, and so their trajectory was very, very different. And for those who don't know, that's in Spanish. And yep. and it was, I think, the first that NPR produced as, as, as a podcast. And, and did that matter, the move to podcasting? Because, uh, I mean, Latino USA was always interesting to me because I'm very random in how it is that I listen to the radio. It's just, if, if I'm in the car, it's on. And so I'll hear whatever it is. And if I'm you know, teaching late at night, I hear late at night. If I'm teaching early, I hear early. But Alt Latino is different. You have to find it, right? Uh, uh, you, you, you have to seek it out because it is a podcast. And so how is that podcast space affected both the ability to have more Latinx voices, but also for them to not be part of the standard, quote unquote, uh, product that NPR puts out. Yeah, I mean, it's been both empowering and disempowering. Uh, and spoke, for example, even Latina USA has moved more towards a digital platform. Uh, and so they, they air both terrestrially, if station managers agree that it's worth having. Uh, and investing in, and not many do. Um, and so I think prior to sort of the emergence of digital platforms, Maria Hinojosa um, would get frustrated at, at station managers because they they didn't see the value in it. Um, and so you had to rely on these gatekeepers. Uh, podcasting allows you to circumvent that and to reach you know consumers directly. You do need the support of NPR. And in this case, she felt that they weren't supporting it. Uh, now it's PRX, but you need some sort of distribution platform that will support it and promote it and market it. Um, but for the most part, you don't have to rely on these gatekeepers at the local level. Uh, so that can be empowering. Uh, you can play with format. You don't have to kind of adhere to the standards of airtime. Uh, so there's some, you know, really kind of positive things that come out of it. At the same time, what it has allowed NPR to do is to kind of create hierarchies of space. So there's their flagship terrestrial experience, things like All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Weekend Edition, that are their flagship programs, and things that they will you know, promote uh, heavily as part of their brand and part of their identity. Having a podcast allows them to have it both ways. They can lay claim to diversity, look at all of the things that we're doing, and at the same time, not really um, keep it sort of at the margins, right? Not really embedded into the, the on-air broadcast experience. And in speaking with some of the folks that are, you know, producers with some of these podcasts, I think there was the hope that by becoming part of the NPR family, they would find their ways more onto things like All Things Considered, you know, snippets of what they're finding, um, being able to have some of these rollovers. Um, and those opportunities haven't come as much as they had hoped that they would um, when they initially agreed to partner with NPR. Uh, I remember several years ago having a moment in the car in which as one of the journalists was signing off, they, you know, they said their name for real. And I, I had this moment of, huh, that was a change. Like that was a change. We're not having an anglicized name. We're, we're, we're having the name. Um, the three, uh, the three case studies are amazing and we're not going to do justice to them in the podcast. So people will have to buy the book for, to get the fine grained, uh, uh, excitement of how people are negotiating and being thwarted at the same time. It, the, one could imagine getting to the conclusion of this book and it being very depressing. Um, you know, you have 
you have shown in a pretty convincing way that, you know, NPR understands itself to be doing a kind of an objective, very sort of passive journalism, but that that that, that, that is actually an, an ethos, that is actually an ideology, that it, they can't hide behind the impartiality. It's not impartial. And as you say, it, quote, obscures the ideological work conducted by the network. But rather than ending and saying, like, this is terrible and there's nothing to do. You you have some ideas about what to do and in the conclusion, which I'd love you to talk about. And also this book had to go to press at some point. And so things have happened since then. So I, I guess as we're closing, I, I'd like to invite you to talk a little bit about how it is you see for potential for change, something that goes beyond the quick fixes that um, one you know who's in NPR might want, and and also whether anything has changed um, since you did the research for the book that would also make you more hopeful about what the network might be doing or what other spaces might be doing that could create uh, the same kind of, of of space for the development of um, sonic citizenship that you're hoping. No, that's a great they question. Might achieve. And I think about change happening almost on a spectrum where you have very, very conservative change to transformative change. Um, and so on the conservative change is, is what's happening right now with sort of the exit of, you know, high profile um, journalists of color. Uh, but the answer is to hire somebody else or hire more. But they're very, very conservative forms of change. And I think NPR has known for a long time what some of these practices are. So you want to diversify your talent, not only at the host level, but at the journalist level and at the producer level. Uh, you want to invest in programming that reflects a, a greater range of voices. Uh, you want to change the sources. You want to change your sensibilities through uh, organizational training. Uh, you want to engage communities more directly. And so these are things that NPR has known all along. Like they're not new. Uh, some of these go back to you know the early 1970s. It's just a matter of committing to them. Um, and in that way, NPR is not different than any sort of elite organization. You know, they are conservative and they tend to not not want change or at least transformative change. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum is is complete transformative change, where you sort of break it down and build it back up to rethink the model altogether. Um, what is NPR? Who is it serving? Uh, is this the way that we even do it? Um, should we be thinking about our target audience in very different ways? And so not just thinking about this high-end audience um, in more ways that could be diverse, but saying, okay, we're not going to we're not going to pursue a high-end audience altogether. We're going to really focus on the disenfranchised. Um, what would that look like? How would you change programming if that was sort of your point of reference? Um, transformative change is not something that heavy organizations are are likely to do, but there's a whole play area in between uh, where people can do it. You know, again, commit to it, commit to it long term, invest in resources uh, with the things that you can do. Um, just again, what I found is that because of the economic pressures are so severe in any kind of media marketplace, um, organizations are not likely to make any kind of, of change that could disrupt uh, the current status quo. I think where I guess maybe I find help is that like, I, I don't see NPR ever moving away from a market model. I don't think media ever moving away from a market model, just given kind of where we are as, as uh, a capitalist society. But there might be dynamics within the marketplace that can exert pressures on NPR that um, individual listeners can't. So in this case, competition from other podcasts. So if you look at what's happening in NPR right now, they have great talent that are leaving for commercial enterprises, whether it's the New York Times or CNN. Uh, and in some ways, these commercial outlets are outdoing um, NPR. They're out NPRing NPR. And so in that way, you know, there, there is more product out there in the marketplace that might open up new opportunities for new kinds of voices and new kinds of stories. So as you know, right now, it's a pretty immature marketplace. My assumption is that over time, that marketplace will become more saturated with players and it will become a more mature marketplace. And within that, you might find outlets that are um, that are, are more you know, conducive to working class Latinos that give them civic information that draw them in politically not just music formatted stations, but something that can really be of, of political significance for working class Latinx listeners. Um, so the hope is that maybe the marketplace can offer uh, some of those pressures, um, or if anything, exert pressure on NPR to, to really invest in significant change. And this is one of those things, um, 
that in, in speaking with people at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that they're aware of is that this model is not sustainable for NPR. Their audience is getting older, and unless they enact any kind of significant change, they're not going to be relevant anymore, especially when given the emergence of competitive players. Um, the demographics don't favor them. Uh, the marketplace dynamics don't favor them. And so as one participant described it is like, well, do you lead it into gradual decline or precipitous decline? And in some cases, the safer answer is just to like, okay, let's just let it kind of play itself out uh, rather than making these really kind of assertive or um, bold decisions that might kind of just bring it to precipitous decline. I think that's sort of the the confrontation that they're faced with. Well, I can't tell you how much I learned from this book and how engaging it it was. I'm interested in what you're, I know you just finished this book, but what are you working on now? What's the next book that we can look forward to? So it's, it's a little bit different. So it's on uh, Cuba and how representations of Cuba are projected through um, corporate discourses. So specifically looking at the rum industry and discourses from Bacardi and then Havana Club, which is Cuba's state brand of rum and how they're competing to present an authentic version of Cuba. Um, so that one's that one's the, the next project. Uh, I'll be heading to Puerto Rico hopefully in March uh, and then back to Cuba. I've been going to Cuba for the past um, on and off a couple of years. Well, I can't wait to interview you uh, on that book as well. It sounds like it's, it's going to be terrific. And also I envy you going to Puerto Rico in, in March. Um, Christopher Chavez is The Sound of Exclusion, NPR and the Latinx Public, has been our guest today. The book is from the University of Arizona Press in 2021. And I want to thank Daniela Campos, the senior editorial assistant who helped me with the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today, Chris. Thank you.